The following program was produced by the Theosophical Society in America. Thank you, and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight and for the wonderful hospitality here that, that we always experience. My comments are going to be a response to this book, um, The Unlikely Disciple, written by a, a college student, and the subtitle is A Sinner's Semester at America's Holiest University, um, written in 2010 by Kevin Roos. And Kevin Roos and the college he goes to, the one founded by, by Jerry Falwell in, in Lynchburg, Virginia, give you the two ends of the religious spectrum. The spectrum of Christianity in this country, as I describe it, I teach a course every year called Religion in Contemporary America, and, we, and we're using this book in the course now, and students love it. I think they appreciate that it was written by a college junior and that it's very well written brings together this spectrum. And so I'm going to have you imagine it, just imagine a spectrum. And in the middle, sort of the watershed division, is the dogma of biblical inerrancy, which is the belief that the Bible is true in every respect. Or that the Bible is like front page reporting. That's I'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's the big division. On the right side of this live evangelical and fundamentalist Christianity. And on the left side, the mainline churches and liberal Christianity. In today's America, denominational differences don't mean nearly as much as they used to among Christians. You could be a Methodist and be liberal or fundamentalist. And that's true of most denominations. Some are more typically liberal, like the Episcopalians, but I had a student in class who told me he was a fundamentalist Episcopalian. I said, that's an oxymoron. He said, I said, you can't be a fundamentalist. He said, but I'm from Texas. I said, OK, that's, that's OK then. You know. But normally, you don't meet fundamentalist Episcopalians. So I mean, when I was a kid, and would come home for lunch. My mom would always be listening to, I don't know, none of you are old enough here to remember this, but a, a radio show called Our Gal Sunday. And it always started out with the line, can a girl from a little mining town in the West find happiness as the wife of a wealthy, entitled Englishman? Our Gal Sunday. And she had been left on a railroad tracker in some impossible situation that she was always magically rescued from. And in a way, this is kind of like the girl from the mining town in the West and a wealthy, entitled Englishman. Kevin Roos is, sometimes thinks of himself as secular. He's going to Brown University. But if he has a religious identity, it's a very liberal Quaker. So that is over here on the end of the left spectrum. Because the only thing you have to believe to be a Quaker was stated by its founder, George Fox. You have to believe there is that of God in everyone. It's actually a pretty big belief in terms of its content, but it's simple in terms of its presentation. That there is something of God in everyone. That's the only creed. And on the other hand, you have Liberty University, founded by Jerry Falwell, representing the most fundamentalist form of Christianity. And so you're bringing those two together in the semester that he spends there. And he goes there, you know, a very interesting person. I'm sure we're going to see more books by him. Not only is he a good writer, he's a good thinker, and, and he's a fair thinker. He doesn't go there to make fun of anyone. He really wants to understand what's going on because he recognizes that there's not much communication between these two groups. And that whenever there's not communication, there's stereotyping. I think I can say we liberals, since I'm usually identified as kind of a crazy liberal. Liberals often pride themselves on their lack of prejudice you know, toward people of color and gays and lesbians and immigrants and so on. But we don't do so well with fundamentalists. 
Oftentimes, comments are made in the most liberal of churches in which fundamentalists are written off almost as though they're all illiterate uh, and, and you know, barely can, can read a theological text. Well, that's not the kind of people he finds there. His science teachers have PhDs in science. The students are well-read, well-educated. They, they use the uh, internet just as much as the students at Brown. These aren't really monsters. They don't fit the stereotype. And that's what he wants to do, and that's what I think he does. He puts a face on fundamentalism. You see, we, we tend to live in these separated cultures, what sociologists call enclaves. In the studies of religious diversity in this country, scholars say we have a lot of diversity, but it's not often engaged. That is to say, we don't talk to each other that much. Near Lake Forest College is Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, a prominent evangelical seminary. I had a student from there who wanted to sit in on a, a Latin class I was doing, and we got to know each other. And after about three weeks, he said, you don't believe in biblical inerrancy, do you? I said, no. He said, I think you're the first person I've met who doesn't believe in biblical inerrancy. I said, well, you're one of the first I've met who does. <laughs> you see, we don't talk to each other. I mean, Common Ground, where, where I teach every week, has no rules for who comes to workshops. But it's sort of self-selective. I mean, if you go to a study center for dialogue, you, know, you don't go if you're a fundamentalist. It, it's not the kind of environment that you would enter. And if you did go once, you probably wouldn't go twice. So we live in, in separate worlds. And Kevin Roos wants to get beyond that stereotype. I remember when Jim Kenney and I went to the former Soviet Union to visit Soviet Jews, refuseniks, you know, I didn't realize until it happened how I had been so conditioned, you know, growing up and thinking of that, you know, all the Soviets would be in uniforms, kind of goose-stepping like you see him do around Lenin's tomb. And as we drove from the airport, the first thing I saw was a guy in an undershirt out mowing his lawn, and his kid was playing with a wagon. And all of a sudden, I, I just thought to myself, you know, <laughs> He's not wearing a uniform, and he's not goose-stepping. He, he, he could be my neighbor. Okay. But do you ever find that? I mean, you, you know, we tend to see the world through these grids that have been built up, especially when we have no live contact with the people. And, and we're dealing only with the idea, the cultural idea that one group has about another. So this project of his is imaginative, creative, daring, difficult. And, and I think he brings it off pretty well. So it's a, it's a marvelous book to read, and it's really a model of the kind of thing that you know, we need more of, this kind of breaking down of stereotypes. And, and it only happens through live contact. And it's amazing what does happen. One person who comes to a number of my classes, I always like to tell his story. He grew up in a, a poor for, farm family in southern Illinois, and his dad was in the Ku Klux Klan. He said, you know, Ron, we had sheets hanging on the porch. And he got a scholarship to the University of Illinois, and his roommate was an African American. And they became great friends. And then he started to date a girl who was Jewish, and he converted to Judaism. So he's now a Reformed Jew living in Highland Park, Illinois. And I said, well, how is it with the grandkids? He says, well, my dad puts away the sheets when we come to visit. <laughs> So live contact, I teach a course on a Jewish, Christian, Muslim dialogue. And Ayel was in the class last spring, and we had a little dialogue one night with two Israeli students and two Palestinian students. And I also work with an organization that brings Israeli Jews and Palestinian Muslims over for dialogue in the summer. And um, the American kids were saying, because the Israelis and Palestinians were saying, we never meet, we never talk to each other. And some of the Americans, why don't you meet? Why don't you get together? Why don't you talk? And one of the Israeli kids said, well, how often do you get on a bus, you know, as a white suburban kid and go down to the south side of Chicago and walk around a black neighborhood and get to know people? And all the American kids said, well, we don't do that. He said, well, we don't do that, you know? 
He said, not that I feel we'd necessarily be killed, but he said, you know, as Israelis, we'd feel a little uncomfortable walking around the streets of Hebron. So again, we live in self-isolating realities, even when we're geographically proximate. We, we tend to live in enclaves. I mean, it's that whole story of we, we tend to clone ourselves. We see this in hiring practices. We see it in the justice system. It's not necessarily conscious. I mean, I, when I was dean, I did a lot of hiring. It's probably not conscious. But most people tend to hire people like themselves. It, life is easier when you don't have to explain yourself. It's more challenging when you have to explain yourself. When I was dean, I asked some of the, the, uh, the black students, said, well, you know, why don't you sit more with the white kids? And they said, oh, Dean Miller, you know, why don't we have to explain ourselves? You know, can we get a suntan? How do we fix our hair like this? You know, and he said, you spend the whole dinner explaining yourself. He said, we sit with other black kids. We don't have to explain ourselves. And I think all of us like to be with groups where you don't have to explain yourself. It's, it's comforting. It's a comfort zone. But given the fact that we live in a world that has been described as post-geographical, we no longer live in a geographical place like I did growing up and perhaps some of you. We really live in the world. My classroom is fitted with technology that I could have a class with six kids from Lake Forest College sitting on the table and at the other end of the room, you know, through Skyping, I could have six students from Moscow who look like they're sitting at the same table. We could have a class. I have a student from Costa Rica that I work with. Every Sunday night, she has dinner with her family. She Skypes. She says, I sit at the table. She said, I, I don't get the food. But she said, otherwise, I'm there in Costa Rica for Sunday night dinner. Okay. So in a sense, we're post-geographical. We're no longer tied to a geographical location. We're wherever our laptop is. Okay. So in this kind of a world, we can't afford not to know each other. I mean, you probably know that through centuries of European history, the average person didn't travel more than 10 miles from where they were born. 10 miles. And imagine if we went around this room and chalked up the miles that we've put in collectively, and how many parts of this planet we visited. Okay. Well, when you only went 10 miles, it didn't make a lot of difference how you thought about people on the other side of the mountain. But in our world, we're, we're living in each other's laps. And we need to know about each other. Okay. And at the, at the 1993 World Parliament of Religions, Hans Kung, who's been one of my favorite religious thinkers for a long time, said something that just kind of burned into my mind. He said, there'll be no peace among the nations of the world until there's peace among the religions of the world. And there'll be no peace among the religions of the world until there's dialogue among religions of the world. And there'll be no dialogue among the religions of the world until there's correct knowledge. And all of a sudden, it fell into place for me that what I was doing in my teaching and in Common Ground, in my books, is following that order, correct knowledge, leading to dialogue, leading to peace. And it's amazing how little correct knowledge there is. I've especially been doing a lot of workshops on Islam. And I start out by handing out a blank sheet of paper, and I say, OK, you know, I'm going to give you three words. Just give me your, your immediate reaction. Islam the Quran, and Muhammad. I said, I'm not going to collect these. And then at the end of the workshop, if it's a two-week, three-week workshop, whatever, I say, OK, pull out those papers and look at them. Have you changed your mind about anything? You know, and some of them are just flabbergasted. They're like, I'd be embarrassed to tell you what I wrote. I've changed my mind radically. They really had no correct knowledge about Islam. And I have two thick files on Islamophobia, just stuff I get on the internet, packed with lies about the Quran, lies about Islam. Uh, 
Pat Robertson on national television said, Muslims worship the moon. He said, Allah is not God. They worship the moon. So there's a profound lack of that knowledge. And we, we, you know, we tend to think of it, well, Christians need to know about Buddhists and so on. But sometimes the most difficult dialogue is within the same faith family. Quite frankly, it would be easier for me to have dialogue, as I do, with Hindus or Buddhists or Jews or Muslims than for me as a liberal Christian to sit down and have conversations with fundamentalist Christians. That would be much harder for me. And yet, this young man does it. Well, I mean, there's no, there's no substitute for reading the book, but I will sort of try to you know, give you some ideas that might help. I'll look at this in three sections. First, a little background that I think helps in reading anything about the religious conversation. Secondly, to talk a little bit about the people he meets, things he likes about them, things that are strange and foreign to him. And thirdly, a little bit about the mission statement and the curriculum of the college and how it differs from a place like Brown, where he goes, or a place like Lake Forest College. So that's kind of where I intend to go. But as always, I'd like this to be interactive. So you know, ask questions. You, you don't have to wait for the break. If you've got a question, raise your hand. I read a statement just a few days ago that I like a lot by a famous mathematician, Carl Steinmetz. And he said, you only become a fool on the day you stop asking questions. Isn't that a great line? So there are no bad questions except the ones you don't ask. So feel free to ask as we go along. First, let me give you a couple of background things that may help. The first is that little landscape picture that I gave you, that spectrum, and the prominence of the dogma of biblical inerrancy. To teach at evangelical centers, such as you have here in Wheaton, or that we have, uh, generally a teacher has to sign a statement that they believe in the dogma of biblical inerrancy. I think it was here in Wheaton not long ago, I mean a few years ago, that a faculty member converted to Roman Catholicism and was promptly fired because the Catholic Church does not teach biblical inerrancy. So again, understand biblical inerrancy. It means no error in the Bible. Or a way I'll sometimes put it is, think of the Bible as God's words in the plural. I mean, they're mediated through human beings, but they're God's words, almost as though you know, I would be dictating a letter and, and someone would be typing it. Okay? Secondly, yes? Yeah, the, the, the question is, is, you know, do you find something similar in Islam? Yes, and you find it in Judaism. You see, when historical criticism was introduced in Germany by the scholars, it's part of the split that occurred between Reform and Orthodox Judaism. Orthodoxy believes that God dictated the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, to Moses in Hebrew. And I recently talked to a rabbi at a synagogue where I was teaching, and he said, you know, he said, I, I grew up Orthodox. He said, my practice is Orthodox. But he said, when I was going to seminary, I went to the conservative seminary, which is one of the den denominations that does accept historical criticism. Because he said, I don't believe that God dictated the Bible to Moses in Hebrew. So the Jewish community split for various reasons, but that was one of the reasons. And this is the most significant split in terms of Christianity. Not whether you're a Methodist or a Lutheran. The, the bigger split is how a Christian understands the Bible. Now, let's take the largest denomination in this country, the Catholic Church. 26% of Americans identify as Catholic. In the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, the document says the Bible is inerrant without error 
in its spiritual teachings. In other words, the Bible is a spiritual text. But it can be full of errors about biology and about etymology and geography and, and all the other disciplines. Secondly, the council said, the Bible, although inspired by God, is written by human beings. And they have their own limitations, linguistic, cultural, political, economic. And when you read a biblical text, you have to keep those in mind. Now, that's generally the position of the mainline churches. So in many mainline churches, after a reading is read at the service, someone says, this is the word of the Lord. Now, notice, that's in the singular. This is the word of the Lord. That means here's a message okay, from God. You know, a general directional message about how to live your life in the world and with God. But on the other side of biblical inerrancy, it's the words of God, you see? You see that difference? Another way to say it is, one of the first forms of historical criticism developed in Germany was called Formgeschichte, which means genre criticism. Realizing the Bible has different genres of writing. Well, take your morning newspaper. You read a morning newspaper. There are about 15 genres of literature in a newspaper. And because you've been socialized to read newspapers, you adjust normally. In other words, front page reporting is different from an op-ed piece or a letter to the editor. And then you've got sports and obituaries and comics and all sorts of things. So when you read a newspaper, you're going through maybe 15 kinds of genres. But fundamentalists tend to read the Bible as though it's all front page reporting. Whereas historical criticism teaches you genres, poetry, a mashal, which in English can be a proverb, a parable, myths that doesn't mean things that, that aren't true. Myths are true, but they didn't happen. They're not factual. These are all genres of literature. So when you open Genesis and, you know, you read the story of the Garden of Eden, you don't go out looking for Eden. You ask yourself, what does this mean? See? Myths have meaning. You look for meaning. If you start to read it as a front page report, you get into all sorts of trouble pretty quickly. Like, you know, where did Cain and Abel get their wives? Right? Or in the Noah story, how did they get all those animals on the ark? Well, at Liberty uh, University, they teach what's called short earth creationism. In other words, all their faculty teach that the earth is about 5,500 years old. And it was created in six literal 24-hour days. Now, it's tough because the sun wasn't created till the fourth day. So exactly how you get a 24-hour day before the sun, I'll let them figure that one out. So they answer these questions, OK? I mean, they seriously address these questions in class. Dinosaurs were contemporary with human beings, according to the short Earth theory. So how did Noah get those dinosaurs on board? Well, either they were brought on as eggs or as baby dinosaurs. And why didn't the lions eat the lambs? Because God put all the animals in kind of a hibernation state for 40 days. They, they didn't eat at all. They just slept. So these are serious questions that are addressed, and answers have to be found. Well, there's not enough water on the Earth's surface to flood the whole Earth. Well, his professors say, not now, maybe, but maybe then. And of course, the trump card for fundamentalism is uh, God can do anything. So what about when we find fossils? Well, God created fossils. Why not? God can create fossils. One fundamentalist said, God purposely created fossils just to confuse these atheist scientists. <laughs> so, you know, there's such a difference here about religion that I think it really, um, it's the greatest challenge to, to Christianity. Since the American mainline is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, okay, um, 
I think for Judaism, you know, the, the great challenge is assimilation. Judaism is one of the few religions that decreasing in numbers, it's below 2%. Mm -hmm. For Islam, it's globalization. You know, how do traditional Muslim countries adapt the West? And for Christianity, it's polarization. I think the biggest threat to Christianity is this growing gap between people on the right and people on the left. This profoundly different way of reading the Bible. And when you read the Bible differently, you understand life differently. So I really think we need dialogue on, on this topic. Okay. And so Kevin Roos is thrown right in the midst of this, you know, as he tries to assimilate it. So does that make sense? Biblical inerrancy means no mistakes about anything. It's all front page objective reporting. The mainline churches say, like the Catholic Church and Vatican II, this document is inspired by God's Spirit to give us a sound direction about the way to live our lives. Like there are some, I didn't count these, someone else did, there are about 30,000 verses in the Bible about taking care of the poor. So we got a pretty good idea that that's good advice. We better do it. Okay. So that's what the Bible's for. And even back when I was a freshman in high school with Father Hindelang at a Jesuit high school, I remember he said to us, if you want to know how old the earth is, talk to the scientists. He said, that's got nothing to do with religion. He said, what religion is saying is, what the Bible is saying is, that whatever happened and however it happened, God is behind it all. One scientist was quoted recently, he'd been an atheist all his life, and he said, you know, I'm beginning to think the universe is a set-up affair. Well, I mean, that's what religion's been saying. It is a setup affair. It isn't, it isn't ultimately randomness, you see. But how old the Earth is and how it all happened, that's the province of scientists. So never in my life did I have any, did I have any conflict between following evolutionary theories in science and being a Christian. I, I never saw those as having any problematic relationship to each other. But for many Christians at Liberty uh, University, evolution is constantly put down. Okay. And it not only is it put down, but he says it's made fun of in sarcastic ways. Without being too political, uh, the, the Tea Party candidate in Delaware, is it? The woman whose statement now says, I'm not a witch. She it was quoted in a piece by saying, if evolution were true, we would have no monkeys today. In other words, over time, they would have all become human beings. So there you have it. There's proof that evolution is wrong. We still have monkeys. OK, so this is background for this, because this helps you to understand you know, what the underlying conflict of mentalities is between a liberal Quaker and a, and a fundamentalist. So, um, you know, the book tells us early on that uh, Jerry Falwell founded this place. Uh, he envisaged liberty as a Christian safe haven where young evangelicals could get a college education without being exposed to binge drinking, pot smoking, sexual experimentation, and all the other trappings of secular co-ed culture. So the rules are very strict. Um, generally, you know, men and women are not to be together one-on-one. -on -one. Anything more than holding hands would be punishable by fines up to $500. There are no mixed gender dorms. All our dorms at Lake Forest are mixed, except one, in which case, when the donor gave the money, she said, it's to be a women's dorm forever and ever, and it still is. Otherwise, all our dorms are mixed gender. Um, you know, so this is a different kind of a world. It's, it's, it's defined differently. It's, it's understood differently. Okay? So 
who does he meet there, you see? Uh, is he going to meet these really strange people? Well, he really tries to fit in. He doesn't lie. He doesn't tell all the truth that he wants to write a book, but, but he doesn't lie. I mean, he admits he's from Brown. He admits that he's not sure about his religious commitment. He admits that he wants to understand this form of Christianity. And he said, I used to be a secular kid. Still am, I guess. It's hard to tell sometimes. These days, I go through the motions of a model liberty student. I attend prayer groups. I sing in the church choir. I spend my Friday nights at Bible study. When it comes to socializing, I follow the old Baptist moral code. Don't drink, smoke, or chew, and don't go with girls who do. <laughs> but what my friends here don't know is I haven't always lived this way. In fact, everything I'm doing here, the Bible study, the choir, the clean-cut morality, uh, any kind of um, improper language is heavily fined. And like many college students at secular colleges, uh, Kevin Roos is given to a few secular expressions. He said, it's all part of a borrowed life. Three months ago, I was a student at Brown, a school known for everything liberty is not. In fact, it wouldn't be unfair to call the schools polar opposites. Liberty was founded as a conservative Christian utopia. And by those standards, Brown, with its free-spirited student body, its grades-optional academic scene, and its active chapter of the Young Communist League, is just a notch or two above Sodom and Gomorrah. So he knows his Bible, at least to that extent. But, okay, we're going to look at what goes on in the classroom and what are the students like. What are the real people like? What life lives beneath the stereotype? Well, first of all, let's start with the classroom. Everybody takes a class in contemporary issues. This is a general education course, and it's the foundational course in Christian ethics. As a result, he says, it's a large class, over 200 students in my section. Okay. Now, what is this about? Well, all classes begin with prayer. He quotes the prayer of, of his teacher. Lord, thank you for bringing these students to my class. You have them here for a reason, God, and I pray that you'll allow me to say the right things. Anoint my teaching, Lord, and pour out your blessings on these students as they enter the new semester. In Jesus' name, amen. One thing that strikes him about the students is he finds them very sincere and very nice. They really take time to ask you how you're doing, and they really seem to care. A lot of it has to do, they're a little bit more conscious than many other college students because they're not recovering from a night of alcohol and other drug use. And he finds this kind of refreshing. He said, you know, I think at Brown we'd do a little better if we did a little less drinking and a little less drugs. So he kind of finds that environment refreshing. But one of the biggest things is they're sincere. They're sincere and they're caring. When the disaster occurred in New Orleans, the first churches to take in families were black Baptist churches that have a fundamentalist theology. They took in all these families. So again, a lot of the stereotype of the fundamentals is not true. Okay. This course is about half Western philosophy and half Christian reactionary training. We study what's been taught in the modern world, Marxism and uh, you know, Nietzsche and whatever, but we, we study it to see how it's wrong. We study it in an adversarial way. Okay? So that's the main thing. The, the university is founded on the idea of absolute truth. There is an absolute truth. There is an answer for every question, and that answer is in the Bible. 
And this is not ambiguous. It's not to be debated. It's clear. And that's their mission, to teach this truth to their students so that their students can teach it to the world. And why? Because those who don't accept this belief face an eternity in hell. It's that simple. A rabbi friend of mine says, you know, I never mind, he said, when fundamentalists come to me and try to convert me. He said, they're not doing it to be annoying. They're doing it out of sincere love. He said, they truly believe that I'm going to hell if I don't accept their beliefs. He said, I admire them for that. And I admire them for taking the time to try to help me. And you're going to find this in the more conservative elements of all the religions. Saul Bellow tells the story that he was flying back, I think, from Israel once and seated on the plane next to a, a Lubavitcher, a very conservative Jew. And of course, this Lubavitcher had never read Saul Bellow. He didn't know he was sitting next to a great author. He just knew he was sitting next to a Jew. And he said to Saul Bellow, do you keep kosher? Do you follow the dietary rules? And Saul Bellow just kind of putting him off, said, well, you know, in Chicago, kosher food is expensive. Now, this guy worked in a garment factory, and he said to Saul Bello, if I sent you $25 a week, would you keep kosher? And Saul Bello said, really not. And Saul Bello wrote, he said, I was so touched, he said. I mean, first of all, Saul Bello has enough royalty money to keep kosher if he wants to keep kosher. But secondly, that this guy, who doesn't make a lot of money, would send him $25 a week if he would keep kosher. Okay. The interesting thing is, the people on the, and Martin Marty has made this comment, great church historian, the people on the conservative end of religion have more zeal than the moderates and the liberals. I mean, I have to beg clergy to come to our campus, but the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he'd be there every day, and I could have 20 ministers from Trinity every day at the college. I could have any number I wanted. They'd be there. But to get a mainline clergyman, it's pulling teeth. And I have a friend, the father of a student. He's a principal in Wisconsin. He says, Ron, wherever you talk, tell people, get on the school boards. He said, the school boards are all fundamentalists. And he said, that's controlling the textbooks, the books in the libraries. He said, I can't convince liberal Christians to take the time to get on a school board. He said, around me, all the school boards are controlled by fundamentals. So, you know, liberals tend to be kind of live and let live. It'll all work out. But because of the very narrowness of fundamentalist belief, they've got energy and, and zeal. These kids spend their spring break going down to Fort Lauderdale you know, and confronting all the college kids going into the bars and saying, are you saved? Okay. So they're sincere about that. They believe that. And, you know, and that impresses him because, you know, at Brown, there's not much that everybody agrees to. See, the idea of a university, as it began in the Middle Ages, Universitas in Latin both means a school of higher education and the universe. Europe was Catholic Christian. All classes at every university were taught in Latin, whether you were at Oxford or Barcelona or Paris or wherever you were. And the idea of a university was to help you understand your place in the universe. And everyone who taught at the universities had one view of the universe. Now, it's often been said today, we don't have universities anymore. We have multiversities. One faculty member at Harvard said, the only thing we have in common is the heating system. <laughs> I mean, at Lake Forest College, we all believe in a liberal arts education. Our mission statement says we're to teach people how to read, write, talk, and think. But we don't have one conviction about the universe that we all share. One of the biology teachers, very nice guy, he came out to me, he said, you know, Ronnie, you seem like an intelligent guy, nice guy. He said, but I have to tell you, he said, I don't get what you're doing. He said, it seems to me like 
the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy. Now, that's a direct quote. He said, I teach biology. That's real. He said, how do you spend your time teaching this religion stuff? I said, well, it's kind of a long answer. Let's, you know, let's go out sometime and we can talk about it over a beer. So, you know, we, we don't have any. Now, I'm not saying we should. We, we live in a, in a diverse universe. But at Liberty University, you know, they, they have to sign a form to teach there that they believe in biblical inerrancy. And it's true at Trinity. One of our faculty members, she applied at Trinity, and she showed me the form that you have to sign. I'm sure it's the same in Wheaton. Um, you know, a sign of what you believe. And it has to be in line with that doctrine. Okay, so after the general ed course, he also has a um, creation studies course. Now, the teacher, Dr. James Decker, is a real scientist. He has a PhD in biology. He's written articles. Now, you might ask, how can he seriously believe that the universe is, and the Earth is 5,500 years old, created in seven 24-hour days? I think, and you may have ideas on this, I think the only way you do it is kind of live in two worlds. So that, you know, during the week you live in the same world as anybody else, and when you go in church, you put on a different kind of mind. And you live in that world for that hour. And at a Unitarian church where I was talking recently, the president of the... Uh, of the church, they were having a kind of a guest day, said, and the words kind of stuck with me, he said, this is a church where you don't have to leave your mind at the door. And I was impressed by that, because that's the church I want. I don't want to have two minds, one that I use for an hour on Sunday and one that I use the rest of the week. I can't live like that. I don't want to have to leave my mind at the door when I read the Bible or when I go to church. I want to go with the same mind with which I understand the universe the rest of the week. Now, I don't know. Do some of you have answers? Some of you have grown up in fundamentalist communities. How can you have a PhD in science and teach that the earth is 5,500 years old? Do you have any? I mean, you know, you can learn that carbon dating is wrong, that God can create fossils, uh, that kind of stuff. But how do you do it? I mean, how do you do it? I don't do know. Do it out of fear. Okay, good. That's a, that's a point. I'm doing a workshop now at Common Ground on sort of the good and bad sides of, sides of organized religion. And one of the things organized religion does when it feels nervous is use guilt. I mean, you get some short-term results. I don't think you get long-term results. But if you can get people to be afraid of hell, you know, that might be a way of getting a certain kind of conformity. Um, despite all that, you know, we're talking about religions getting to know each other, talk to each other. The biggest puzzlement for me is how any human being can think that their system of dogma has arrived at all the answers. And this is what all the, all, all, all the um, fundamentalist things have in common, whether it's Judaism, Christianity, yeah. secular humanism, they all think we've got all the answers. That's yeah. why they laugh at each other. But to me, that's the big divide between people that don't think they have all the answers and people who think they have all the answers. I, I think that's a, a, a very good point. You know, many of you know I'm a big fan of William James. And he said once, ultimately, we're in the universe as our cats are in our libraries. <laughs> Meaning, you know, we don't know a lot. And one of my favorite philosophers, Gabriel Marcel, said, reason can never understand the universe. Be willing to accept that. I think there is, and it's not necessarily deliberate, but I think that that kind of a system that says all questions have an answer and we have all the answers, is unselfconsciously arrogant. There's a lack of humility. Now, 
Don't get me wrong, liberals can be as arrogant about liberalism as fundamentalists can be about fundamentalism. I was a classics minor in college, and we were taking a very difficult Greek course, reading Sophocles, which is very difficult Greek, and we were struggling, and one day our teacher said, a very stern Jesuit said, gentlemen, you will all die ignorant, but with some effort you need not die hopelessly ignorant. <laughs> and you know, that was one of the greatest things I was ever told, because I kind of breathed deeply and said, I'm going to die ignorant. I'm not going to have all the answers. And once you can say that, you can kind of take a deep breath and live with it. Martin Buber, the, the Jewish philosopher, said, we have to live securely insecure. To recognize that the human condition is limited, we, we don't know everything. Now, you know, we, we do the best we can with what we know, and that's okay. You know, new teachers will, we have a mentoring system where we old timers mentor the new, new teachers will often say, what do I do if a student asks a question and I don't know the answer? I say, just tell them you don't know the answer. I said, I do it all the time. <laughs> a teacher isn't supposed to know everything. If I'm not learning in the classroom, what fun is it for me? And I have this one pretty sharp student in last spring, he, uh, I, I was talking about a, the text, and he said, you know, Ron, he said, I, I don't think you're interpreting that sentence correctly. He said, I think it means this. And I looked at it, I said, you know, Evan, I, I, I think you're right. About 10 minutes later, he raised his hand again. I said, Evan, do you think I'm going to let you be right twice in one class? <laughs> I said, I'm not that humble, <laughs> you know. So it's OK not to know. It's OK not to know. As long as we're doing our best, as long as we're not abysmally ignorant, it's OK to be ignorant. It's OK not to know. At the World Parliament, they had this wonderful Korean Buddhist teacher. And he's known as uh, not know, because that's his big model. He said, 50 times a day, just say to yourself, not know. <laughs> You know, and I think, I, I agree with this gentleman, I think every fundamentalist needs 50 times a day to say, not no, no. And take a deep breath and realize it's okay. Well, we'll take not a deep breath, but a break. And when we come back, I'll give you all the right answers to everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions from the break as you've mulled things? Uh, yes, Ron. Um, I'm a member of a uh, fundamentalist Pentecostal church, and I'm also a member of the Theosophical Society, and I try to live my life ethically according to the teachings of the Noble Eightfold Path of Buddhism. <laughs> am I correct in not seeing the contradictions and all that, or am I in serious need of a therapist? I guess, you know, I'd want to have, the question is, you know, can you follow the Eightfold Path of the Buddhists and um, the teachings of the Theosophical Society that talk about, in 1875, the brotherhood of all religions and be a fundamentalist Christian? I would see a problem. Jerry Falwell says that interfaith dialogue is the work of Satan because Christianity is not a religion. Religions are human attempts to connect with God, and they're all false. Christianity, true Christianity, is God's successful connecting with human beings. And Jerry Falwell teaches, taught, he passed on now, um, he taught that if you go to an interfaith meeting, you're betraying Christianity because you're suggesting that Christianity is a religion among other religions. Now, I went to a meeting recently of heads of interfaith ministries at about 22 colleges in Chicago, sponsored by a Muslim group. And we all had a very interesting experience in common. Our Jewish and Muslim kids and Christian kids get along pretty well. Now, almost all these schools have two Christian groups. We have True, which is 
the evangelical Christian group that believes biblical inerrancy, and then we have faith for foresters. Foresters is what you call a student at Lake Forest. That's run by the uh, Presbyterian youth minister across the street, and that would be mainline and liberal Christians. Now, we have an interfaith center that I started same time I started Common Ground. It's kind of like the campus version of Common Ground, and we have a steering committee every week, a meeting, and representatives from each of the groups come. And they come, the Baha'i representative, the Hillel, the um, Muslim student group, et cetera. The only group that won't send a representative is the evangelical Christian group. Because as their moderator explains, it's offensive to sit down in a conversation with people who have false religions. Now, of the 22 people at the meeting from 22 different campuses, they all said, our students get along fine. The only group that doesn't cooperate is the evangelical Christian group. And it's not because they're being mean, it's because if you believe you have absolute truth, why would you talk to anybody else? Now, it's not just Christians. I had uh, some Catholic friends in the city, and their neighbors were Orthodox Jews, and, and the, the husband was a rabbi. So they had me over for dinner one night to, to visit. And they had you know, a catered kosher meal, so it would be fine with the Orthodox Jews. And they had daughters the same age, and they learned how to, what kind of food they could serve when she came over, you know, an apple on a paper plate, this kind of thing. So we sat, we had a very nice evening, and the rabbi and his wife went home, and the Catholic couple said to me, we never talked religion. I said, no. She said, I had told him that you were a religion professor. I thought he'd have some questions. I said, look, I said, think of a scale, okay? Over here, you have the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, dictated by God to Moses in Hebrew. And over here, You've got this Goisha cop, you know, this Gentile professor who has some ideas about religion. Which is going to outweigh the other? God's words or this guy's? I said, why would he ask me anything? He has God's words. So my only difficulty with your situation is I don't know how you bring it together because Falwell would say to you, you shouldn't be at the Theosophical Society. You shouldn't be looking at Buddhism. Th these are false ideas. You should be home reading your Bible. Now, how you bring it together, you know, I, I can't tell you. I mean, but for me, it would be a problem. Perhaps there's a slight difference if you think of charismatic, yes. which the Pentecostal would be, but not, and not so much. They would even identify with the mystical. Yes. But not possibly totally fundamentalist. I think that's a good point. I think the, the Pentecostal church movement really focuses on religious experience more than creeds, propositional statements. The, the Jerry Falwell fundamentalists focus on creeds, creedal statements, things you believe. If you're talking about religious experience, then you could dialogue with Hindu mystics and Catholic mystics and Jewish, you know, that would be, if you're talking experience, like William James's book, Varieties of Religious Experience, I think that would be a, I think your point is very well taken. That would be a basis for dialogue. But if you're talking about beliefs, then I think it would be hard. Then I think it would be hard. So that would be very interesting to pursue. I, I, anything else? When you say mainline churches, um, I don't think that's on. But I'll repeat the question if it is. Uh, when, oh, there, oh, there we go. <laughs> oh my goodness. When you say mainline churches, does that include? You know, I'm just thinking of the progressive movement, in, in which there's great dialogue and pluralism. Um, Generally, when we say mainline, we're talking about denominations. Um, oh, and that's and, really not. And so, Roman Catholic, Episcopal, Methodist. Uh, United Church of Christ, the American 
Lutheran, uh, I mean the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Oddly enough, evangelical is used in two ways. A traditional way means related to the gospel, because evangelium is the Latin word for gospel. So Garrett Seminary on the Northwestern campus says evan an evangelical school. Well, it's a very liberal school. That's the old meaning of evangelical. The new meaning is the belief in biblical inerrancy. So when we talk about evangelicals in the United States today, that refers to a belief in biblical inerrancy. So that's what we mean by mainline, those, those denominations. The American mainline today consists of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Interestingly enough, the three religions of Abraham. So that's kind of how we use mainline. It's not a matter of numbers, because Jews, the numbers are very small. But because of the influence of Jewish thought and the presence of Jews in cities, because in Europe they couldn't farm, I mean, they were in ghettos, and so when Jews were emancipated, um, you know, they went into professional schools and, um, and lived mainly in cities because you know, they, they had no land, they had no farmland. So um, you have a larger impact. I mean, when I was growing up, the largest group in this country, immigrant group, were Germans. But nobody ever guessed that. My relatives came here from Germany, you know, to Ottawa, Illinois, to farm. But nobody ever guesses Germans because they're all living on these farms in Illinois and Wisconsin and so on, you see. They're, they're, they don't tend to be urban, at least that first generation. Yeah. Okay, so now we come to the science course. I mean, this is every biology professor at Liberty teaches that God created the universe about 6,000 years ago in six literal 24-hour days. This is the most extreme version of creationism, the most literal of the literal, and it makes no compromises. Carbon dating is defective, and Noah's flood is as historical as the 1985 World Series. Okay? So this, this is the, the mindset you have to understand, and that's what I mean when I say Christians live in two very different worlds. Now, the question I've been asking ministers for a long time is, can you have a church with Christians from both sides of the spectrum? And I get about 50-50 in their responses. Personally, I think no. I think what's going to happen is everybody's going to be unhappy. And I think, like, there's a famous church, unfortunately the minister is retiring, Bill Thompson, at Lake Street Church. I mean, he's straight out clear that, you know, this is a liberal, and the term often used is post-denominational Christian church. It used to be a Baptist church, and he's a Baptist minister, but they redefine themselves. It's no longer Lake Street Baptist, it's just Lake Street Church. And it's explicitly defined as post-denominational, um, a, a liberal community, and it really thrives. See, I think it's clear in Judaism. If you go to an Orthodox synagogue, you know that they're teaching that God spoke Hebrew to Moses. If you go to a conservative or reform synagogue, they're not teaching that. And one rabbi friend of mine in, in Chicago told me that he said, you know, I'm Orthodox. But when it came time for seminary, I went to the conservative seminary, and he's rabbi at a conservative synagogue because he said, I didn't believe God spoke to Moses in Hebrew. So in Judaism, you kind of know that. You're not going to walk into a reform synagogue and meet anybody who thinks that God dictated the Torah to Moses in Hebrew. But when you walk in a Christian church, you may well meet such a person. And seated right next to the person in the same church may be someone with a very liberal understanding of biblical revelation. And I don't know in the long run that's going to work out. Because all your sermons have to be different. All your teachings have to be different. These are like two different religions. I do a retreat every year in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin at a for United Church of Christ Church, and the minister there says that when the Christian clergy meets in Fond du Lac, the Missouri and Wisconsin Synod Lutherans, that's the cons conservative side of Lutheranism, if the ministers want to say a prayer together, now these are all Christian, they have to leave the room or they'd be expelled from their denomination. They cannot say a prayer with a minister from another denomination than their own. Now, how do you put two people like that in the same church and talk about the Bible or talk about anything? 
I don't know how to do that. So in my classes, I, you know, every once in a while, you know, I'll have a fundamentalist and I'll say, this class is teaching the historical critical method. You don't have to believe it. You can be an atheist or a Jew or whatever you want to be, but that's what you have to learn. That's what we're teaching here. See? And if I were a minister in a church, I think I'd have to say the same thing. I'd have to say, you know, I believe in the historical critical method, and that's what I'll be <coughs> teaching from the pulpit. So I don't know, that's something to ponder. Uh, I just had a, a thought in reaction to what you just said. You said you cannot see how these people can sit next to each other in the same church, and to me that's a very hopeful sign that people can live with the, the, the ambiguities, with their differences, and, and still see the value in each other, which... See, that, no, that, that wasn't my point exactly. Oh. I have no trouble seeing the value. I'm saying, if I were the pastor of the church, we would have, as Bob Thompson does, interreligious days in which Buddhists and Hindus and so on took part in the celebration. Now, for fundamentalist Christians, that's unacceptable. How do I make everybody happy if half my church is fundamentalist and half my church is mainline? That's the part. I mean, but I'm glad you asked that question. It's not about being able to sit with each other. It's how do you plan a church, like for Bob Thompson, when it's communion time, he said, everyone's welcome. If you're an atheist or a Jew or a Muslim, whatever you are, this table is for you. If you feel drawn to this table, come and receive. How could a Missouri Synod Lutheran sit through that who doesn't even believe he can say a prayer with another Christian minister? You see my problem? But no, you're absolutely right. There, there's no reason we can't you know, associate. I did a workshop for Unitarian Church once and put them in circles, and we did a dialogue on dialogue, and each chair had either a blue or a white card on it, and if you had a blue card, you were a fundamentalist, and if you had a white card, you were a Unitarian. And I said, okay, here's the scenario. A, a fundamentalist church is moving next door, and you're part of the committee from the Unitarian Church to meet with their committee, and their committee are all the blue card people, and you're going to talk about how you can be good neighbors. And you know, role playing is very effective. People really get into it. And a number of the Unitarians had been raised fundamentalists, so they knew how to do it. And you know what the conclusion was? They could share a food pantry. They could share a uh, you know, collection of clothes. And they could share in certain charitable works. But they couldn't have services together. They, they couldn't have their children play together. Because for fundamentalists, playing with Unitarian kids could be very dangerous. I mean, Unitarians wouldn't worry about playing with the fundamentalist kids, but vice versa. And, you know, they really came up with some very realistic... They thought they could share the same grounds committee and the same snow plowing system. But th what they could share is limited. How, then, can you have one church and put both of those folks in one church and be a pastor who can deliver a meaningful message? I just don't know how to do it. But half the ministers I talk to say... You can do it. So I'll leave you to ponder that. Now, here's a point he makes. All in all, the Liberty students I've met are a lot more socially adjusted than I expected. They're not rabid, frothing fundamentalists who spend their days sewing Hillary Clinton voodoo dolls and penning angry missives to the ACLU. Maybe I'm getting a skewed sample, but the ones I've met have been funny, articulate, and decidedly non-crazy. They play pickup basketball, partake in celebrity gossip, gripe about homework, pretty much like my friends at Brown. Okay. Now, he said, what are the differences? He said, liberty students depart from the mainstream, mainstream in fairly obvious ways. Politically, your average secular student is a little bit left of center, whereas your average dorm 22, that's the dorm he lives in, resident is somewhere right of Alan Keyes. I mean, they are very conservative politically. Okay. So, now, he also lists um, characteristics. Four dominant themes that, that I think helps to give you a picture of how the worlds are different. So first of all, he's saying, you know, these are generally really fine human beings. They're caring. They're honest. They're loving. If they say they're going to pray for you, they'll pray for you. Um, yeah, they're pretty, 
Pretty good kids. Where are the differences? One, evolution didn't happen. Okay? There's constant anti-evolution jabs that are just part of the social landscape. Like, you know, the one made, what's her name in Delaware? Oh, yeah, O'Donnell. Is it? Yeah. You know, if evolution were true, there'd be no monkeys. This is standard talk there, that people who believe in evolution are very stupid people. Don't they see how we're not like monkeys, you know? Um, two, the, the biggest amount of anxiety, and here's where, I mean, Kevin Roos has to be a, a, a good person. He says, I just want to hug him and tell him to relax, is their concern about whether they're really saved. And you know, one of his friends at, at Liberty says, you know, yeah, I, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but maybe when I die, God's going to say, you weren't perfectly sincere, and so you're going to an eternal hell. So they really worry about this. Now, see, this concern is really born at the time of the Reformation. Growing up Catholic, I was always puzzled when street corner evangelists would ask me if I was saved. I never thought about it. I mean, to me, it was about being holy, I mean, being a better Christian, but I just took it for granted. I mean, I was baptized, I was in the church, you know, I was living a Christian life. Of course I'm saved. It never was a question for me. But the Reformation introduced subjective thought. See, Catholic theology was that, you know, when the priests say the word at Mass, Jesus is present. And the priest might be a sinner, an atheist, whatever. If he intends to do what the church intends, then it's a valid sacrament. Luther and the reformers said, it all depends on the intention of the minister and his faith. If his faith is not sincere, then nothing happens. And once you introduce that subjectivism, how do you know that when you stood up in church and said, I accept Jesus, my Lord, how do you know you were 100% sincere? Maybe you did it because your friends did it. Maybe you did it because the minister pressured you. Yeah. And so he says, a lot of these kids at Liberty are very worried about being saved. Yeah. Number three, and this is a puzzle too. A lot of these things are puzzles to me. The category of people against whom they address the greatest scorn are homosexuals. I mean, if you're playing basketball, whatever you're doing, anybody who does something wrong, you said, you know, you're a fag, that's queer. They have a deep emotional um, negative feeling about homosexuals, which is odd because, you know, I said, the Bible has 30,000 verses on poverty and says nothing on homosexuality. The word didn't appear until 19th century. There's not a word of Jesus about sexual orientation. And nowhere in the Bible does a consenting gay couple talk to Moses or Paul or Jesus. So we got nothing in the Bible. And what's interesting is they're not concerned about social justice. I mean, you would think the people they'd hate would be the Madoffs of the world, the people who are robbing the poor. No. The people that upset them are gay people. Why? Why this vehemence? I don't know. Except at Liberty, they teach, there is no such thing as homosexuality. All people are heterosexuals. And they have a minister who runs the program. And if you think you have same-sex attraction, you talk to the minister, and he counsels you, and you're taught that this came from a bad upbringing. Your father was weak, and your mother was dominant, and this is a psychological deviance, and you can be cured of it. So that's one thing. Real homosexuality does not exist. Now, I would say, you know, as we see more and more evidence of the genetic component of homosexual orientation, this has got to put these kids in terrible psychological turmoil. And one way we deal with that kind of turmoil is to project it as hatred. 
I mean, some of the most homophobic people are often people who are nervous about their sexual orientation. And so they project it out. So I don't know, but that's strange. I wouldn't have expected that, okay? Abortion is murder. That's that. We should all fight to get Roe versus Wade repealed. Uh, they have strong political agenda. We should fight for a constitutional amendment that Jesus Christ is the real leader of the United States, that this is a Christian country. Um, you know, prayer, Christian prayer should be in the schools, et cetera, et cetera. You know the scenario. And here's the biggest one, perhaps. Absolute truth exists. At Liberty, unlike many secular schools, professors teach with the view that there is one right answer to every question and that these right answers are found plainly in the Bible. And their job is to transfer those right answers from their lecture notes to our minds. Now this is the biggest difference. You know? If I were to identify myself philosophically, I'd say I'm a Christian existentialist. And that means, as Kierkegaard said, Kierkegaard said, that the great Danish philosopher theologian, said, I believe there's an absolute truth, but no human beings will ever know it. Absolute truth exists only in God's consciousness. Everything we know is relative. Everything we know is an interpretation. To see is to see as. We all live in a matrix of interpretations. I agree with Immanuel Kant. We never touch raw reality, what he called the ding an sich. Everything we know is interpreted. The way I often illustrate this for students is to just write on the blackboard and say, what's in the room, you know? Oh, a microphone, a podium, you know, a television set, a coffee maker. And then I say, okay, now we're going to go to the rainforest of Brazil, and we're going to pick up one of the indigenous population that has never been out of the rainforest, and we're going to put them down in this room. And what do they see? Do they see a chalkboard? No. Do they see a podium? No. Do they see a microphone? No. Do they see a television? No. Almost everything they put on the board would not be seen. I mean, because they'd have no words for it. I mean, they might say there's some kind of object up there in the front, and it's brown, or whatever word they use. Okay. So we live in a world of interpretations, which answers the question, why did the chicken cross the street? No chicken has ever crossed a street. <laughs> because streets don't exist in chicken consciousness. If you're a parent, you had to teach your kids what a street was, right? Kids just run out. And you have to say, wait, this is a street. That means cars are on it. Look, see? All these dead raccoons were going to drive by going home. You know, did they come to the curb and say, watch it, guys, this is a street. Look both ways. No. Because streets don't exist for them. Okay. One of our science teachers was asking me once, she's done a lot of work on guppies. She said, you know, the guppies are in a fish tank. What do you think a guppy thinks when it hits a glass wall. I had no idea. <laughs> she said, well, I've spent my life studying guppies. She said, I think they interpret it as a water current, a resistant water current, because they know water currents, but they don't know glass walls. So we are never reacting to reality. We're always reacting to an interpretation of reality. So we can't have absolute truth. The human mind can't, because absolute means no connection to anything. Totally free. Even if we speak a language, that's an interpretation. No word, and I've spent a lot of my life translating, no word has an exact equivalent in another language. No word. Not even no. Not even no. Not even table. You can't table emotion in German. And as our French teacher says, an affair is a matter of business. An affair for the French is not a sexual relation. So two people don't have an affair. Right? 
So every language, Max Muller, the great scholar, said every language see, is a petrified philosophy. Every language is a series of interpretations. For instance, in Hebrew, you can't own anything. Because, you know, the Bible in Leviticus, God says, the earth is mine, you are its tenants. So the Hebrew Bible teaches we don't own anything. Things are given to us for our use. So in the Hebrew language, if I want to say, I have this book, I say, yesh li sefer, there is a book to me. Meaning, I have a temporary relationship to this book. But I don't own it. I don't own it. I can't own it in Hebrew. Okay. So for me, this is the biggest problem, that absolute truth exists. I have no trouble with that. But that the human mind can know anything absolutely, I find absolutely wrong. <laughs> See? We can't know anything absolutely without relationship. That's impossible. That's another reason I don't think God revealed any books in any language. Because if God spoke Hebrew to the Jews and Arabic to the Muslims and Greek to the Christians, those are three different messages. So those are some of his problems. He's very, you know, the Quakers are very big on social justice. These kids don't worry about social justice. They don't spend spring break fighting for health care and the poor. They spend spring break going into the bars in Fort Lauderdale and trying to convert people and giving them Bibles. Okay. They're interested in belief. Um, Kevin Roos is heterosexual, but I mean, you know, he has a lot of gay friends. His one aunt is a lesbian or has a partner. So for him, this notion that there are no homosexuals is not only wrong, it's deeply offensive. And saying that homosexuality is psychological deviance coming from a bad home is just nonsense. I mean, one of my students after graduation did two years research on pheromones, body odors. Male homosexuals have the reaction to male pheromones that women do. It's a biological difference. You don't get a reaction to odors from your dad being weak. So, you know, a lot of this stuff to me is not just wrong, it's abusive to people. I mean, the real homosexuals on this campus must be living hell okay? in any society that suppresses this. Remember, Ahmadinejad said they have no gay people in Iran. And Professor Sadri at the college, who's Iranian, said, I had a friend in college who was gay. He killed himself. Even in this country, gay children have a 26% higher likelihood of committing suicide. So not only do I think that's objectively wrong, I think it's a dangerous, hurtful teaching. And it harms people. Okay. So, you know, some of these problems for me are very deep-seated. And these are the issues he sees. Now, let me give you one more example. He says, you know, not everybody at Liberty toes the line. You know, they break rules. But he said, what's interesting is what rules you can break and what you can't. And he says this, the trick to being a, liber a, a rebel at liberty is knowing which parts of the social code are non-negotiable. For example, one of my friends listens to secular hip hop, but he would never be caught defending homosexuality. And although some of these kids in the dorm will tease others by stealing their towels from the shower stalls, leaving them naked and wet and stranded, they would never suggest that Mormonism could be a true religion. See, so there are things you can get away with. You can sneak off campus and have a beer. You know, you can go out alone with a girl somewhere in secret. I mean, these things are wrong, but you know, they, they can be forgiven. 
But the day you would stand up in class and say, maybe human nature is different, and maybe just like some people are left-handed, when my dad was in school, I think my dad was left-handed, but he was right-handed all his life because left-handed kids, they tied their left hands behind their backs and made them be right-handed because everybody is naturally right-handed. And left-handed people suffered a lot from this. So if you tell a group of people that they're all heterosexual, you know, it's like tying a left-handed kid's hand behind his back. I mean, you're forcing them to identify themselves in a way that isn't natural for them. Right? So you can't say that. But you could sneak a beer. You know, you could pull a prank. There are things you can do. He says, um, in other words, liberty's true social code, the one that they don't say explicitly in their 46 page manual has everything to do with being a social and religious conservative and not a whole lot to do with acting in any traditionally virtuous way. You see, political and religious conservatism go hand in hand. So when I teach like the roadmap of American religion, I have the main line, and then I have a quadrant we call the religious right, and a quadrant I call the liberation left. Now, the religious right is precisely a mixture of politics and religion. Maybe we separate church and state, but you can't separate politics and religion. Gandhi said, whoever thinks you can separate politics and religion understands neither. So when I go down to Naples, Florida, do workshops down there, you know, and some guy comes up to me with you know, carefully groomed short hair and an American flag pin, I can pretty much know what his position is going to be on about 15 different issues. It's right down the line, from repealing Roe versus Wade to getting rid of the immigrants to a prayer in the schools. We go right down the list, and I'll bet you I'm going to be right most of the time. And that's what they have at liberty. That's the real cohesive force. You can get away with having a beer or fooling around with a guy or a girl. I mean, if you're a girl with a guy, a guy with a girl, not girls with girls or guys with guys. You can get away with an occasional curse word. I mean, you'll pay a little fine. But you cannot take a liberal political or religious view. That's the real underlying unity of, of the university. That's what, you know, Falwell said in the early moments of the moral majority, we are taking over this country ward at a time, alderman by alderman, congressman by congressman, and this will be a Christian country at the end of it. And I take that very seriously. I told my students in class today, I don't think I'll be alive to see it, but you know, if this movement goes unchecked, all of this may happen. There may be a constitutional amendment. There may be Christian prayer in the schools. Roe versus Wade may be repealed. You know, a lot of this could happen. And it's happening in our textbooks in Texas recently. They decided to take Jefferson out of a prominent position and just give him a line because they discovered he wasn't really a Christian. He was a deist. And they want to say that all of our founding fathers were Christians. So those who, aren't, who don't have a clear Christian record need to be excised from our history. Okay. So I don't know. I think I'm more concerned about this than Kevin Roos. I mean, I see this as a very energy-filled, directed, political religious movement that can have very real consequences in the United States of America and could give us a very different kind of country in a relatively short time. Oh, he needs a mic. But disagree with me if you disagree, because I tell my students I'm close to infallible, but not fully infallible. Um, I, I just had a comment. Um, this goes back maybe 30 or 40 years. I was in discussion with some of my friends, and 
They said Nazism could never happen in the United States, and I said, yes, it could. And I wonder if the risk of something, if this became widespread, this is like the, the sharp end of the spear. Right, I think, this is the when, you know, when people say that, and, and I, you know, IL is the politics major and religion major, I think that our governmental structures are such that, um, you know, it's not exactly, Germany had no experience really with democracy. The Weimar Republic was a fledgling experience and it didn't last long. Obama said the other day, and I think he meant it, I'm not so sure I would say it, he said, I, I have trust in the middle class. Although economists tell us that's disappearing, but he said, I have trust, you know, I think the middle class of America would not vote for a constitutional amendment that says Jesus Christ is the Lord of this country. Even if they're Christian, they would not want that in the Constitution. And, you know, he, he may be right on that. But there are days I'm not so sure. Because I think of my friends saying, tell your mainline people to get on the school boards. This is not a joke. See, no textbook can be sold in this country that isn't approved in Texas. That's our largest market for textbooks. So if you're writing a textbook and it doesn't pass fundamentalist censors in Texas, you have no chance of it having any popularity in the schools of this country. So I think I'm a little more concerned than Kevin Roos is. Although I would certainly agree with him, I want to make a big distinction between fundamentalists and fundamentalism. I mean, he's certainly right that fundamentalists, you know, are mostly kind, compassionate, holy, caring people. It's fundamentalism. It's this doctrine of having the absolute truth. That's what I see as dangerous. So that's, that's kind of the general drift. But, you know, as, as always, nothing really replaces reading the book, because he's witty, he's humorous, and he puts a face, as I said, on fundamentalism. And for those of us who may operate with a stereotype, uh, I think he helps to dispel that stereotype. On the other hand, he points to legitimate concerns about what is being taught at a place uh, like Liberty University. Ron, I think this evening has been just uh, exceptional. And I appreciate very much you bringing uh, your ideas and making them palatable and thoughtful for all of us. I think um, as we approach the difficulties that you've d addressed, that there's one basic element that we have to keep in mind, and that is, I think one of the driving forces of fundamentalism is the fact that it says to its listeners, I have a way for you to find comfort and security. Yeah. And many of us who enjoy going out on the limb, who enjoy uh, uh, discussions and dialogue with people with whom we disagree, we are willing to um, encounter that fear. Mm -hmm. Many people are not. Right. And I think that your concern is well-founded because many in our country just want security and comfort. I, I think this is right. I mean, I think and there was an article recently that said, on average, George Bush's answers in, um, you know, what do you call those things, those conferences, was two minutes. And Obama's is seven minutes. And one person said to me, I don't like Obama at all. Because he's always saying, from this viewpoint, from that viewpoint, can't he just say yes or no? See? No. Because thoughtful people with subtle minds can't just say yes or no. I mean, it's like I get these questionnaires, you know. Do you think the Bible is true? How should I answer that? I think it's true in one sense. 
I think it's not true in another sense. You see? When I was a Jesuit seminarian, we took a course in child psychology together at St. Louis U, and there were about 12 of us in the class, and the first exam came. It was a, I know, multiple choice or true and false, and you know, we all got Ds and Fs. And we went to see the teacher. He said, oh, don't worry. He said, the Jesuits always get Ds and Fs. He said, you guys are too subtle. He said, you just got to answer. <laughs> you know, you got to think simpler on these questions. He says, don't worry, I'll just grade you on your papers. He said, I learned long ago, I just throw out the tests of the Jesuits. <laughs> because your training is, is to too much subtlety. Okay? So I think it's very interesting, not only in religion, but in politics. A lot of Americans want a sound bite answer. That's right. okay? It's the same, you understand? You don't change your mind when you're talking about religion or you're talking about politics. Your view of the world is still, is there a right answer to everything? Is there an absolute truth that we can all learn? Are there these simple soundbite answers? Or do we have to look at the subtleties of issues? Reza Aslan, one of the best of our Muslim writers, has a book on um, how to fight a cosmic war. And his, and his answer is, don't. See, a cosmic war is fought by people who think that they are right and the other side is wrong. Other kinds of struggles are, well, <laughs> we've got some things right and some things wrong, and so do you. Let's talk about it. See? But in a cosmic war, you don't talk to the other because you're right, they're wrong. There's nothing to talk about, whether it's religion or politics. There's nothing to talk about. You can proselytize. I was doing a panel at Northwestern with the rabbi. We were in the synagogue, and we're talking on dialogue, and a Christian fundamentalist stood up and you know, started to proselytize the group. And the rabbi nudged me and said, well, he's one of yours. You deal with it. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, you know, this day was billed as Jewish-Christian dialogue. I said, dialogue means you're able to learn something. I said, do you feel that you're able to learn anything from the rabbi and the Jewish participants here? He said, no. I said, then you're here under false pretenses, and you should leave. Not because of what you believe, but because of a system that doesn't allow for dialogue. And I said, this has been billed as a day of dialogue. That's the issue. Yes? This young lady needs the microphone. Okay, let him speak. Oh, you have a question. Go ahead. I also grew up in. You got to talk right into the thing, from the top. Okay. Um, I also grew up in a fundamentalist uh, sort of church, and I know it's very emotional. It had in relation with uh, family members. It is very difficult to speak uh, to certain people. If talk you, right into it. Put it right in front of you. Yeah. If you, it's very difficult to speak to people if you feel they won't listen. They they won't don't accept you, and sometimes it's projection, but sometimes I think it is very real psychologically. Um, Given that, and given your comments on, on this point, I'm feeling a strong emotional sense from you, what is the nature of dialogue then? Okay, if one good. is speaking or trying to a very good question. make connection yeah. to emphasize you know, common humanity right. uh, with someone you think, maybe you know, doesn't want to acknowledge that in you. Right. Well, that, has, you know, that was my major concentration in my PhD work, and I've been working in dialogue for some 40 years. And there are rules of dialogue. The first rule of dialogue is, are you willing to change your mind about anything? And if not, don't engage in dialogue. Because the first principle of dialogue is, I'm willing to change my mind. The second principle is, Allow people to define themselves. If you're a man, you don't get to define women. If you're a Christian, you don't get to define Jews. People define themselves. The third principle is careful listening. When I conduct dialogue, who is ever speaking holds a pencil, and when the next person wants to speak, they have to summarize what the first person said, and the first person has to agree, and then they get the pencil and can say something. Now, in 40 years of doing dialogue, on an average of about 50%, the person says, no, you know, 
you're not saying what I intended to say. Now, if that average is roughly correct, that means that in our workplaces, in our churches, you know, in our dining rooms, half the time, we're not understanding each other. And that's why I don't like to teach without the possibility of interaction. And in my classes, students will tell you, I, you know, I'll often say, does this make sense to you? Do you have any questions? Because countless times, people will raise their hand and say, well, I understand you to be saying X. And I'll say, no, I, I, I don't want to say X. That isn't what I wanted to say. And you know, if you heard that, I apologize. It, it wasn't what I intended to say. And we clarify it. So I think those are the basic principles of dialogue. But the most important is, am I willing to change? I had a fundamentalist student take my course a year ago. He needed it because he was transferring to a fundamental school, and he had to have this Bible credit. And he said, the first day of class, he walked in, and all my years of teaching, I've never had anyone say this directly to my face. He said, I just want you to know, I have nothing to learn from you. Wow. That's a direct quote. Now, I'm old enough that I can keep my <laughs> ego out of it, you know. Um, it wasn't a matter of ego. I mean, I just kind of thought, wow, you know, that's sad. And I'd like to meet him 10 years from now and see, my prediction is he's going to be an atheist because he's going to see that that system doesn't hold and he's not going to have the availability of a more nuanced, subtle system. <laughs> And I think there's a high likelihood he'll give it all up. I don't think 10 years from now he can say that. So. We have one more comment, and then we will end. I don't know if there is a, a basic answer to this, but uh, in our lives today, how can religion be of help, the way we look at religion be of help, to work together in well, unity? One of my favorite writers is Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who's the chief Orthodox rabbi in Great Britain, he's written two wonderful books. One is called The Dignity of Difference, and the other is called something about the home we build together. And he said, religion is a source of our values. It, the minister did a series last year that was so good, he called it Stories We Can't Live Without. And if you read the Bible that way, Genesis and the Noah story and, and, you know, these stories. If you read it that way, it has a lot of power because religions don't just have rules, they have stories. Just give you one quick example. It's a demographic fact that Jews don't vote at the level of their economic peers. It's often been said kind of as a spoof, you know, Jews earn like Episcopalians and vote like Puerto Ricans. Why? Why do Jews vote differently? Because a hundred times in the Bible it says, remember you were slaves once. And I was talking to a rabbi who was collecting money for the boat people in Vietnam, you know. And he said, somebody said to me, why are you doing that? They're not Jews. He said, you don't know our Bible. Our Bible is not about Jews. The first 11 chapters of Genesis, there aren't any Jews yet until you get to Abraham. He said, our Bible is about taking care of the marginalized. Look at the life of Jesus. He was constantly looking at the marginalized. Women, that's the biggest marginalized group. The ill, the sick, the poor. Look at Muhammad. All of his concern was about establishing justice and our obligation to the poor. One of the pillars of faith in Islam is the wealth tax. 2.5% of your gross worth should be given to the poor. And there are stories and stories of Muhammad. He's walking down the street once, he sees this guy's got 12 camels, and he says, oh, you know, that's nice. He said, that guy down the street needs a camel. And then Muhammad says, whatever you have in excess belongs to the poor. See, all these three religions are about establishing a society of justice and peace. Fundamentalism is not very concerned with that. See, we call this the performative side of religion. What you do. 
Fundamentalism is concerned with what you believe. It's a belief system. Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And that's another big difference in the two understands of religion. We have kids who go down there in spring break and work for Habitat for Humanity. Their kids go down and proselytize, trying to make people Christian. From my perspective, where you Habitat for Humanity is very close to the teaching of Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Proselytizing is another whole thing. So, you know, the, the book kind of introduces us to a lot of good questions about religion, about Christianity, and ultimately about dialogue. So I guess the short answer to your question, I don't think some people can or should dialogue. Dialogue is not just a conversation. It has rules. And like the guy who came to this program on the Northwestern campus, he didn't accept the rules. And if you don't accept the rules, you shouldn't involve yourself in dialogue because you're there under false pretenses. I don't know, does that help at all? <laughs>